condition caused by the drug marijuana to which it was addicted. This substance, the most harmful thing about it, was not any inherent psychopharmacological property of the drug, but rather the way we as a society were treating uh, the people who use this drug. It's been a medicine for about 3,000 years now. It only hasn't been a medicine in this country for 68 years. I say in the scheme of things, it's been a medicine a whole lot longer than it hasn't been. Dr. Donald Abrams is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and an oncology physician at San Francisco General Hospital. He says doctors were able to freely prescribe cannabis for various ailments up until 1937. Harry Anslinger, who was a, a prohibitionist and the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, uh, decided to introduce the so-called Marijuana Tax Act. Physicians in the United States knew the medicine as cannabis, and by using marijuana, he sort of did an end run around the medical community. The act imposed a high tax on medical marijuana and such onerous registration and reporting requirements that it effectively banned its use as a medicine altogether. The American Medical Association came out in opposition to the act, with Dr. William C. Woodward testifying there was no evidence the medical use of cannabis was causing addiction, and that there are evident potentialities in the drug that should not be shut off by adverse legislation. He opined that it's impossible to foresee how much the new regulations will deprive the public of the benefits of a drug that, on further research, may prove to be of substantial value. The Marijuana Tax Act delivered the final blow to a medicine that was already being replaced by the opiates and aspirin. Cannabis was removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1942. The fact that cannabis was an accepted, valuable medicine in the United States for nearly a century might be surprising to the teens who grew up watching the dramatizations of reefer madness. It certainly came as a surprise to Dr. Grinspoon. I discovered when I got into the library that I, despite my training in science and medicine, had been brainwashed. Like he put his house. findings into an 80-page paper, aptly titled Marijuana Reconsidered. It was later published in Scientific American. Then his professional investigation of cannabis took an unexpected personal turn. His son Danny, suffering from childhood leukemia, had begun chemotherapy. The chemotherapeutics that he had to receive were just devastating to him in terms of the nausea and vomiting. It's a nausea that goes right down to your toenails. I mean, it's, it's really a beyond description. Even with all his prior research, Dr. Grinspoon still had no idea that marijuana might be able to stop Danny's chemotherapy-induced nausea. One night at a dinner party, an oncology doctor who had read his paper on marijuana related the story of a 17-year-old with leukemia who used marijuana to treat his terrible nausea. On the way home in, uh, from there in the car, my wife, Betsy, asked me, uh, don't you think we ought to get a little bit of marijuana for Danny the next time he gets? And I said, <laughs> I'm almost ashamed to say this. I said, no, 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 that would be breaking the law. And I don't want to offend the physicians, you know, who are taking care of them. Uh, and I, so I was against it. Uh, she's a rather plucky woman, and next time he came in for his uh, chemotherapy, she went up to the Wellesley High School parking lot, and they found his friend uh, Mark, uh, and asked him if he... Mrs. Grinspoon <laughs> wanted a little bit of marijuana. When Dr. Grinspoon showed up for Danny's chemo treatment, he was surprised to find his wife and Danny so relaxed. They were joking and he seemed was smiling and no problem. Uh, he, he got on the gurney, had the injection, and whereas before with this particular chemo, he became nauseous, fell awful right away, uh, and the race to get home before he started to vomit and then in a bed with a with a bucket at his side there until it was just dry heaves. That day he got off the gurney and he said, hey mom, there's a sub sandwich on Brookline Avenue I noticed. Could we get a sub on the way home? When he discovered Danny had smoked marijuana, Dr. Grinspoon was not angry. He was relieved. And I called the doctor, the attending who was taking care of him, and I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to stand in his way doing this again. 
he said, don't, don't, and don't have him do it in the parking lot. I want to see this myself. And so it went. He never had any difficulty with nausea and vomiting with the further treatments for as long as he lived. He was free of that anxiety. And I can tell you, it was not only a relief for him, it was a relief for his parents and his siblings. Uh, it was a godsend. Not surprisingly, Dr. Grinspoon has become an ardent supporter of legalizing marijuana for medical use. People who suffer from these symptoms and syndromes, depending on just how serious they are, that's always accompanied by anxiety. And to take and artificially impose another level of anxiety, the anxiety involved in doing something which is illegal, for which you can be punished, is cruel. By the 1980s, scientific interest in cannabis had begun to catch up with the personal experiences. According to a 1982 United States Institute of Medicine report, Marijuana and Health, the preliminary research coupled with anecdotal evidence warranted a closer look at medicinal cannabis. The report also found that marijuana attacks diseases and symptoms differently than other drugs. This offered the tantalizing possibility for drug companies to develop new, novel drugs out of the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The Institute of Medicine called for more research on these chemicals, known as cannabinoids. Even with this encouragement, research on cannabis failed to flower. There aren't many scientists or clinical investigators who are particularly interested in doing research in medical marijuana because it's such a hassle. Marijuana's Schedule One status means Dr. Abrams has to get approval from more than a half dozen regulatory bodies before he can start a cannabis medical trial. There are so many roadblocks that you have to go through. Marijuana is an illegal substance um, that I think a lot of investigators and, uh, and uh, even organizations just don't want to get involved in something that is so controversial. Dr. Igor Grant is a professor of psychiatry and the director of the California-based Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. He says not only is the research bureaucratically difficult, it's expensive and financial backers are hard to find. You know, an ordinary uh, investigator just does not have the time or resources to do this kind of work. I mean, you really need, uh, you know, either federal or state funding or pharma funding something to, to navigate uh, this whole system. The center's research was funded by a $9 million grant from California taxpayers. The money allowed for a few legitimate small marijuana trials, including several done by Dr. Abrams, that confirmed what Rosenfeld was saying all along, that cannabis works on pain especially pain that does not respond to opiates. All of them, to some extent or another, demonstrated that smoked marijuana is effective in this situation for which we really don't have very good treatments. I can say that the cannabinoids are, are almost certain to be useful in neuropathic pain based on the research that we've done. But even when researchers get significant results like this, Dr. Abrams says cannabis research can still be an academic dead end. When I submit it for publication, I have found what I perceive to be a publication bias, that people are not particularly interested in publishing data suggesting that marijuana might have some benefits. All of those things, I think, sort of dampen anybody's enthusiasm to take on medical marijuana research. And scientists are not getting much help from pharmaceutical companies either. No pharmaceutical company is interested in supporting, you know, marijuana research. Because it's a naturally occurring substance out in the world, so you can't patent it per se. So the research on it is, is quite dicey. It really is. Nobody can make any money on that, that research or on that development. Even if drug companies created a novel marijuana plant drug that they could patent, doctors could not prescribe it. It's going to be a, a, a class one type of drug, you know, it's not going to be broadly used. And again, why do you want to spend a lot of time developing a drug that, that you can't really sell? Why would a pharmaceutical company want to get involved with something like that? I think until, uh, you know, marijuana is rescheduled, large-scale research will probably not occur. 
Advocates have been mired in a decades-long legal fight with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency to do just that. In the late 80s, they made the argument that marijuana has accepted medical value and that it belongs on Schedule II. It was all the judge who, my understanding was, basically suggested that it be made a Schedule II. According to government documents, the DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, found there was incontrovertible evidence that cannabis was an effective medical treatment for nausea and appetite loss, multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury spasms. Judge Young ruled marijuana should be moved to Schedule II, writing, the evidence in this record clearly shows that marijuana has been accepted as capable of relieving the distress of great numbers of very ill people. It would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of this substance. For those who were concerned about marijuana's side effects, Young ruled that as a medicine under a doctor's supervision, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. The DEA and other federal agencies disagreed. They overruled Judge Young's decision and kept marijuana on Schedule I. But the ruling did add to growing pressure on the U.S. government to go beyond its own compassionate use program and make marijuana legally available as a medicine. The answer? Provide a pill that can do what the plant does. For years, the government had been sponsoring and funding research to put the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, into a capsule form. Known as dronabinol or marinol, the drug is a synthetic version of THC created in the laboratory. Since it did not come directly from the plant, the DEA placed it on Schedule II. They wanted to have an answer to people like me. There is a medicine out there that people can buy. They don't have to use herbal marijuana. Dr. Grinspoon says the problem is marinol does not work as well as marijuana. You take people who have used both herbal marijuana, smoked it or ingested it, and marinol or dronabinol. Every time, never an exception, oh, I much prefer uh, herbal marijuana. It was my experience when AIDS patients first started taking dronabinol back in 1992 that they didn't like it. The absorption when taken orally of THC is very variable and low. The gut only absorbs 12 percent, plus or minus a few percent depending on the individual. The problem with taking it through the gut, you have to wait for an hour and a half to two hours to know whether you're getting relief from the pain or the nausea or whatever it is you're trying to relieve. How does Marinol compare in all this? I was talking earlier. I mean, do you mm. feel like it's as effective as the plant or no? No. I do not believe Marinol is as effective as, as marijuana or THC. And why do you say that? I've never really seen it work. We've added on, it's expensive, and I've never had a patient who seemed to get much benefit from it. We really haven't had very much success with patients with Marinol for any um, side effect management.